So anybody have any questions about anything? Remember, I'm always available. Like after this lecture, if you're seeing that you're completely lost, you know, contact me, get together, go over that matching. And that's going to show you a lot of the concepts that you're going to need to know for this. Um, I'm actually right now finishing uh, the review um, for the exam that's coming up week seven. I've just sent it out to the other professors to go over to make sure that um, we need to cover everything in the exam, what might co uh, come up in a HESI or, or come up in your NCLEX, things that we know that's gonna be there. So as you go forward, before you go to the HESI, I would review our review slides, our PowerPoints, very, very important because your information is there. And also before your NCLEX to review pediatrics, it is a great review for you, okay? Because pediatrics is sort of like med surge, but in many ways it's not. So this week is week five. It's amazing. We're almost halfway through. Um, this week is quiz three and discussion questions. The case studies open Sunday. I've had a couple of questions with that. So they open Sunday. Um, and the NCLEX questions are next week and the description is there. There was some confusion about that. So I wanted to clarify for you. So quiz three discussion questions. And um, quiz three, I'll be going over those uh, answers within the lecture today. You should be pretty good when we're done with lecture if you're understanding them. The cahoots does a lot of repeats on it, asking things different ways because uh, there are some concepts regarding, for instance, a PDA, what is it and how does blood flow and what happens, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm gonna ask a lot of questions to try to have you really understand. So got a lot of cameras off today. Is everybody driving today or doesn't wanna me to look at them? What's happening? I'm not um, driving. My my camera is just acting. Whenever I have my camera on, for some reason, it, the internet is like lagging. Okay. Gabriel, please drive. Watch the road. We're going to be starting with the PowerPoint, and then we're going to go to the cahoots. And the cahoots is like 55 questions. So today, we usually will go right almost up to 5 o'clock. So I will try my attempt uh, to get done by 5 but I still wanna get you that information. Probably the toughest week to teach because it's so much information, um, but I know your time is valuable and I don't wanna go over time if I don't have to, okay? So respiratory first. Respiratory is uh, combined in two different topics, upper and lower respiratory infections. Upper respiratory infections are the most common, has to do with something in the throat, even ears is considered upper respiratory because of the mucus that comes. And then lower is usually we consider like a um, pneumonia, whether it's aspiration pneumonia or just consolidation pneumonia. Most upper respiratory infections are viruses. Now, we've heard of something called respiratory cynical virus or RSV. For me and you, this is a common cold. For um, babies less than one year old, it is uh, something that can impede their ability to suck, swallow, and breathe. Because that's all they have to do as an infant, right? Suck, swallow, and breathe. All this mucus gets caught in there. They have low-grade fevers, and they don't feel well. RSV for a normal baby, usually we suction their nose, give saline aerosols, towel for that fever, increasing fluids as it's tolerated, it's fine. Now, what if you're a cardiac child or a child born premature who has damaged lungs? That child can really suffer from all that secretions. So there is an immunization called Synergist which is a monthly immunization 
usually give in during those times of high risk, which is fall to early spring. And we give it monthly to these children to prevent RSV. Um, it's hard enough for them to suck, swallow, and breathe, so we don't want to add that secretions on top of it. Sometimes, and usually the children are older, you get more of the infectious type of processes um, and pneumonias, and then that would, we would treat with antibiotics. Now, with the small little children, when they're born, they're born with mother's antibodies and their immune system, and it wears off. Uh, usually about three months, we start seeing these children getting sick. That is why we give immunizations at two, four, and six months. We're trying for those big, horrible diseases that these children to be immune against um, because of the immunizations. So children usually less than three months, rarely do they get sick. And if they do get sick, we take it very seriously because they should have mom's antibodies in them. After that, we sort of starting to expect it. Toddlers and preschoolers, oh, lots of lots of viral infections, upper respiratory going around. As I've said, this is the age of swapping spit. They go to daycare, they go to preschool, they have toys, things, and everything is in the mouth. Everything is in the mouth, you know, and we know that it's not, you know, likely that they're washing and sanitizing in between each child playing with a toy. So they're spreading the viral disease. Now you're saying, well, that's not good. Well, actually the child now is building up an immune system against that disease. So by the time they get to school age, you're most likely just gonna get the bacterial infections. A lot of times those upper respiratory infections will decrease because as we get the um, immunizations, as we get these diseases, we build up an immunity. So your immunity does increase with age. Now, part of upper respiratory infections is ear infections. A lot of mucus sits in the nose and we know there's these short, small, little areas. And the area of least resistance is the inner ear. And that inner ear gets really full of secretions and it causes a lot of pain. With ear infections, um, we'll treat them with antibiotics because they are an infection. Um, and don't forget to give these children something for pain. Children older than six months, uh, I sort of recommend it is the ibuprofen. Ibuprofen has like that anti-inflammatory in it that acetaminophen doesn't, and it really helps with decreasing the pain. What happens when a child has decreased pain and no fever? They're gonna be up, running around and drinking, which that's what we need. We need those extra fluids in. So what are you going to see in a child with an upper respiratory infection? Well, you will see most likely a little fever, you know, from low all the way up to 105. Um, and it doesn't matter where that fever is, we'll still just treat it. Uh, remember, once you have a fever, the chances of that seizure or life-threatening all have decreased. It's that quick rate of rise which causes those febrile seizures. Children who have a fever, don't feel well, will sit down, lay down, they won't eat. They may vomit once because of all the mucus that's going in there and they just don't feel well. Again, we treat these children, we wanna increase fluids. We want them to eat because nutrition is so important. So medicating them for fever can help keep those, that fever down, keep that kid up and running around and drinking. So what is our goal with respiratory infections? Well, we want them to breathe easier and we want them to be able to rest. That's why we give them the antipyretics. Preventing that spread of infection is important. Washing hands, teaching children as they get older. Get that fever down, of course, because fever's down, they will have plenty of fluids and they'll eat. When the fever goes up, they don't want anything. And again, these children want their hugs and comfort. As I said, otitis media is because of those small, short little uh, connections. Um, and we can treat them just with antibiotics. But let's say your child is getting more than four or five infections a year. At that point, they'll say, well, we need to do some sort of surgical intervention. And that's just putting tubes in the ears. And that just releases the pressure in there. And um, hopefully that will prevent um, any sort of uh, accumulation of fluid in there. As I said, nursing care of a child with an ear infection is to help the pain. They already have 
an infection. So it's not giving, spreading infection or preventing it. They have it. It's taking care of them. And that's making sure that they're comfortable and teaching the parents how to finish the entire prescription of antibiotic. Infectious mononucleosis is also called a kissing disease. Um, it's what I always knew it as. It's a herpes-like Epstein-Barr virus. And what you see is a sore throat, really tired, extreme fatigue and aches and pains everywhere. Also, if you felt, you might feel the liver or the spleen swollen. Now, infectious mononucleo uh, mononucleosis, you know, it's known as, oh, it's just kissing disease. Well, let me give you a little case history of how this is usually diagnosed because it's extremely difficult to diagnose. And it is a viral disease, okay? It's Epstein-Barr virus. So a child will present with a sore throat, fever, um, goes to the doctor's office. They're going to do a strip test. It's negative, probably a flu test or RSV test, and it's negative. Send them home, say, oh, it's just a viral pharyngitis and Tylenol Motrin and rest. Oh, five, six days go by and the kid's still sick. They might go back to the doctor or go to urgent care or ER. And they say, well, okay, well, still, we've checked again for strep. We checked again for RSV or uh, the flu, still not, but let's start an antibiotic just to be sure. Kid's still sick. So now we're up to about 10 days out. Kid at that time usually says, you know, my doctor don't know what he's doing. Let me go to the emergency room. In the emergency room, we will hear this case study, what's going on and say, you know, we are suspecting now that this is mono. So we draw blood. We will do a CBC looking for that white cell count elevated as bacterial, or um, they'll be looking for a mono spot test. So the mono spot test comes back positive. So our job as a nurse is to teach these families and the child about precautions. Now, as I said, your liver or spleen can be swollen. Now, if we have some um, contact with the abdomen, you know, roughhousing with your brothers and sisters or playing sports and the abdomen's not protected, this spleen can burst. So here, case study, something that happened to me. Nine-year-old boy came in with his father, same case history, same, what I said, positive mono. Told him to protect his belly, no PE for three weeks, he had to get cleared through his pediatrician and to protect his belly. One week later, I'm now the primary trauma nurse. So any trauma comes in, it's my responsibility. He comes in, he was on a three-wheeler out in the Everglades riding with his brother, fell off, fell on his belly and he came in dead on arrival. His spleen had ruptured. And this is true and real story. So what is our goal in infectious mononucleosis? Well, it's virus, Tylenol, Motrin, rest, and to protect that belly, no PE until they could follow up with their pediatrician. Now, croup is that really barking, barking like a seal cough. Uh, it's a lot of inspiratory strider because there's swelling in the larynx, okay? If we allow croup to go on beyond just the swelling, it can cause epiglottitis, which is very, very severe, and it is a medical emergency. Well, the epiglottis is what? That's that little leaf-like structure that when you are eating, covers the trachea so food can go down the esophagus and you don't aspirate. Well, it swells so much that you cannot breathe. You're gonna have severe inspiratory strider. What's this child gonna look like? Well, they're gonna complain, their throat hurts. They can't swallow, they're bent over, tripod position and they're drooling. They're trying to find that one space where that airway is open so that they can breathe. So you've got the swelling in this throat, which is covering your trachea. So what do you think the treatment is? Well. Many times, you know, a physician will come into the room and we will just give racemic epis. We will give some, uh, usually start an IV and give some IV steroids, maybe some more epi sub Q, trying to decrease that swelling. Now, 
the only person that can look down the throat because you can sort of see it on this big flap that comes up there is a physician because any person who looks down there could cause more irritation and they might need to do an intubation and that epiglottis is covering that trachea. So it's usually a tracheostomy that needs to be done. So laryngotracheal bronchitis is croup. It's usually just a virus. And again, it's that barking that goes on. What we do is these children come in barking and we'll give them um, usually just a dose of steroid or like uh, Decadron, a shot of Decadron, or it could be uh, prednisolone, which is an oral steroid for two, three, four or five days, once, twice a day, depending on the physician. So usually croup, they come in, this uh, laryngotracheal bronchitis, they come in if they've had an upper respiratory infection, which means they've been coughing, they've had irritation in the back of their throat and the swelling persists. So they have inspiratory stridor and they'll have su suprasternal retractions. You're gonna see they're little between their um, clavicles, it'll be pulling in and this bark, 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 bark. So if we don't treat this, it will continue to swell. They'll go to respiratory acidosis and they could stop breathing on you. So our goal with airway, with this you know, respiratory condition is keep the airway open. And how do we do that? Well, we're gonna be giving steroids to decrease the inflammation. We'll give racemic epi aerosols, which goes right into where that swelling is. We will, of course, if it persists, we need to keep this child hydrated. Now a child with epiglottitis, nothing's going in that mouth because they can't breathe. Any patient, adult, children, don't matter. If you have severe respiratory distress, you're not gonna give anything by mouth. They can barely breathe. So this child will get an, um, an IV intravenously. Some of the croup children, they're still breathing, they're running around, they're not really that bad yet. Of course, we can give them something oral. We'll also give this little tent nebulized mask um, oxygen and that moisture with a little bit of oxygen just eases the way that they do breathe. As I said, um, RSV, it's also called bronchiolitis, synonymous in their name. It doesn't matter if you call it bronchiolitis or RSV. As I said, it goes from um, fall, winter into early spring. And there is a little nose swab that we do take. We try to clear those secretions out and just have them breathe. Um, usually before feeds, we will, you know, take and suction them out. Again, those children that are more compromised, cardiac, premature, cystic fibrosis, doesn't matter, will be giving a, a synergist vaccine once a month for those times of high risk. Then we have pneumonias. Pneumonias are something in the lungs, usually the lobes. Remember, there's five lobes of the lung. It could be due to inhaled, like when we go in, clean the bathroom with bleach and caustic materials because we want our tubs, et cetera, clean. And, you know, you can inhale it and it can burn the inside of your lungs. Good. It could also um, be from a systemic infection that, that comes up and gets you. Pneumonias um, usually are bacterial. We'll treat them with antibiotics. If needed, we'll be giving them aerosols just to help them breathe, help them uh, get the stuff uh, mucus up, Tylenol, Motrin for fever and discomfort, and of course, increased fluids. As I said, it's usually bacterial, but it could be other types. Mycoplasma uh, requires double antibiotics to take care of it. And then thank goodness today we have a pneumococcal vaccine because that was the most severe of all pneumonias. Now pertussis is one of the vaccines that we give, that two, four, six month vaccine, but there are children who are not immunized. Um, it's a parental choice that they don't get immunized, but what they do is they put other children at risk. Just like if you get the flu shot, doesn't mean you're not gonna get the flu. Hopefully you get it less strong than a person who didn't get a flu shot. But pertussis is extremely, extremely contagious. And a small infant be at high risk. These children will be extremely, extremely sick. Um, these children um, 
many times because of how sick they are, they're admitted to the hospital and we need to put them in special infection control rooms where it's called reverse laminar airflow, which means the air from inside the room can't go into the hospital because it's respiratory droplet and it can go and it can infect an entire hospital. Another thing children love to do is to put things in their mouth and then all of a sudden they swallow it. Very common thing is a coin. Now, I wish it was the dime or even a penny, but most of the time it's usually a quarter and it's stuck exactly between the clavicles. It causes pain for that child, it hurts, they can barely talk and then they're drooling, they can't swallow. And that's usually when they tell the parent, I swallowed a quarter. And there it is. So what do we do for this child? Well, usually it's in the esophagus. Usually it gets down to that point and doesn't go into the trachea, hopefully. Um, I've seen other cases of French fries in the trachea, but usually the coin goes in the esophagus. And how do we get that out? Well, years ago, we'd go to the OR, they do bronchoscopy, take these little claws, go down, pull it and get it out. That requires an overnight hospital visit and an OR visit, you know, and it's really not needed. So what do they do today? The first time I saw it working in the emergency room, I was like, hmm, that actually works really well. They take a Foley catheter with a balloon on the end. They put it down the mouth past where the coin is, pull, blow up the balloon, sitting on the surgeon's lap usually, and they lean them forward and they pull it out. They usually vomit up some mucus and the coin pops on the floor. And I can't tell you how many times I said, I've already got my gloves on, it's my quarter. And the kid jumps to the floor and says, nope, it's mine. And it literally takes their mind off of what just happened to them. They're usually monitored for a couple hours afterwards to make sure there's no swelling, their airway's good and they're sent home. Conversely, like I said, sometimes it can go down the trachea. I had a child, three-year-old, swallowed a, a French fry and it went into his trachea, occluded his airway, was rescued into the um, hospital. He ended up on ECMO, which is a machine to oxygenate blood. And the kid didn't make it. Three days later, he did die. So uh, aspiration is a big deal for young children. Um, we diagnose it by x-ray. We can see what's going on. Our goal is to maintain airway and to oxygenate, whether it is with oxygen, performing a trach, intubate, or um, this ECMO that we put them on. So our goal with foreign body aspiration is to monitor their respiratory status, their breath sounds, and monitoring O2 saturations. Now, pneumonias, as I said, could be due to aspiration. A lot of times in the infant, it's due to uh, reflux. So how do we prevent reflux? Well, when you have a child with reflux, first of all, teaching a parent how to burp a child the best they can, sitting them up afterwards, hopefully that will work. Well, some children are a little bit more stubborn and need some more. Many times it's just taking formula or breast milk and putting a little bit of rice cereal in it. Now, rice cereal has no nutritional value because we know you don't give foods till six months for an infant because they can't absorb it. You'll see it in their stools, but what does it do? It thickens the formula or breast milk to hold it down. Then with the burping and positioning after feeds, they usually do well because they can go aspirate it, reflux up and aspirate it into their lungs, which is our prevention. And then of course, you know, I've always loved Johnson and Johnson baby powder. I think it smells good, but today we don't use it on our babies because the powder in the air could go in their lungs and cause an aspiration risk. Another respiratory condition is something called acute respiratory distress syndrome. It's when the lungs get injured, damaged quite a bit. Um, I live in South Florida and what happens a lot is these near drowning episodes. So we found um, many children um, were at the bottom of the pool. Somebody yelled, call 911. Somebody jumped in, brought the kid up, was able to revive them. By the time rescue came, the kid was fine running around the pool. Well, 
these children will still be brought into the emergency room and will be admitted into a monitored area, an ICU or step-down ICU, because that injury could occur up to three days later. And we need to monitor their O2 saturations very, very closely. Another way it can occur is due to overwhelming sepsis. The lungs just can't handle it. Or it could be trauma, could be um, pneumothoraxes. Adolescence, drug overdoses can occur. And as I said, near drowning, because that can up to 72 hours later. How do we treat ARDS? Well, this lung is damaged. It is stiff. It don't want to work. So we need to paralyze, sedate, intubate these children. We need to do aggressive pulmonary care to get those lungs moving and um, really good antibiotics. But these children are hard to maintain any sort of saturations. And a lot of them still die, even with aggressive care, even going on this ECMO like I talked about. Many times they are one nurse to one patient um, ratio because they're that ill. Asthma is a common um, childhood illness that even many adults have asthma. And it's basically a hyper responsiveness of the bronchiate and it swells. And what happens is you can get air in, but you'll have a prolonged expiratory phase trying to get that air out. Usually asthma is due to some sort of an, um, allergy, um, allergen. It could be grass, it could be a cat, could be a dog, it could be um, anything, it could be dust. So once we determine that a child has asthma and it usually doesn't occur till about two years old where we've seen a couple little asthma attacks, what we'll do is we'll do pulmonary functions when they're well and we will see how well their lungs are working. Another thing we've started to do is these end tidal um, monitors where uh, it's a peak expiratory monitor where you take them home. And when you're well, you blow on them and suck in real hard and you get a volume air moved in the, the lungs of the child. When you see your child starting coughing or looking like they're sick, you have them do it again. And if you see the volume of air moving decreasing, then you would increase the amount of aerosols to prevent an exasperation of it because you're ahead of it. Calling the doctor, getting a steroid before it gets to the point of status asthmaticus. Because status asthmaticus is not fun. My husband had it. He was in the um, ICU for 12 days and it was hard to see him not to be able to breathe. And I could talk him out of it, but that he was like this close from being intubated every day for almost 12 days. So that's what we don't wanna do. So we want children to be normal. We want them running around enjoying their normal life. But if you're allergic to grass, you wouldn't be partaking in sports out in the grass, or you'd be doing the skin allergy testing and getting um, something to get you more sensitive so that maybe eventually you could. One of the things with asthma is those little MDI, those little things that we squirt and inhale. Many adults can't even do that. So what we have today is these spacers. This little thing on the bottom, the orange, pink, and blue little thing has a mask. On the end, you put your little meter dose inhaler, squirt the dose, one or two, whatever it is, breathe in and out four or five times, and you've gotten your dose. So you get a child into the emergency room or into the doctor's office who's complaining of asthma. And he had, she had four doses of this already. Ask them how they had it. Did they squirt it and inhale it? Or did they have a spacer to make sure they got it? It could be just squirting in the air and they're not getting the dose. So that can actually, if you're um, having a child in an acute asthma attack and then give them a real dose of it, you might prevent a hospitalization. So how do we treat asthma once we know how we do it? Well, we've got that little telltale um, sign, the expiratory meter that we can see what's going on. Um, we're given medicines that are more long-term. Um, in the adult world, you see Simbacort and Brio, which is morning and night, um, or Atrovent. This is called Pulmacort in children usually, and it's an aerosol morning and night 
preventative, not for attacks. Of course, we have those little puffers or albuterol aerosols for those rescue moments. We will, when they're getting to that point of starting to wheeze before they get bad, we'll put them on some corticosteroids. And there's something called Singular Monolucus that we give at nighttime. It's like a Claritin for asthma. It's the only way to describe it. And they're giving them to younger children, age of two, now they're giving it. So now we're going to go into cardiac and cardiac is um, not like adults in most ways. Um, most of these conditions are congenital heart defects, which means baby is born with it. So these congenital heart defects we're going to go into, although just like adults, we can have acquired could be due to infection. Many of the infections are a viral infection that attack the heart and cause you know, cardiomyopathy. Myopathy means big, floppy, not working muscle of the heart. That's all that means. Um, it could be due to autoimmune uh, lupus attacks the heart, right? So it could be that. It could be due to the environment you know, in the air, what's going on, or it could be due to the family tendencies. Now, if you do not remember how to trace a drop of blood in the name of things in the heart, something you must review. So we know that the left side of the heart, the left ventricle is that big pumping action of the heart. So there's a lot of pressure pushing blood out there, right? And then it goes all around the body and then it just gets back to the right atrium. So the right atrium, right side pressure is a little lower than the left side. That makes something important as we're gonna go talk about pressures. Now, garden hose is what I consider a, um, the blood and congenital heart defects. When you have a kink somewhere or something can't get through or it's narrowed, what's gonna happen? Think of what happens to a garden hose. All right, let's look at that aorta that comes up the aortic arch and it goes down and there's that, that little arrow there. What if that was kinked and narrowed, a stenotic area called a coarctation of an aorta? Think about the blood needs to go down, but down it's not getting all the blood it should get. So what would you see down below? Well, decreased or no pulses, the dorsalis pedius or posterior tibial, or what you would see is lower blood pressures in the lower extremities. Now that blood has to go somewhere. All of it can't go down. So some of it's going back, goes back up the aorta and then it goes up those three little vessels which go up to the head. Now, some uh, coarctations of the aorta are not found at birth. They're found later on. And these are sometimes young children three, four years old. Now this is extra flow going to the head. So what symptoms would you see? You might see headaches. You might see nosebleeds from the amount of blood that's going to the upper head. Well, everything doesn't go up there. It still is gonna go back down into the left ventricle, up the left atrium. And what happens, the lung is a place of least resistance and it just fills up. So now you're in congestive heart failure. What is a child going to look with a coarctation of the aorta that was undiagnosed, who is now three months old? This child, his heart's working so hard to try to get blood around, but it's fighting against resistance. That left ventricle is going to be stretched and cardiac output is going to be decreased. The birth weight, probably that's all they weigh now because they're burning calories like crazy to move things around. The fluid is built up in the lungs. So now you're dyspneic, tachycardic, you're retracting. You know, the coloring of the child is dusky, all because of a little kink in the aorta. So what would you see with a child that's not newborn, that we didn't know was going to be a cardiac? You know, it's like that little girl I'm talking about, the coarctation of the aorta. So she was poor feeding. She was tachypneic tachycardia failure to thrive because she can't eat. She tires out so quickly. Plus she's burning calories like crazy. The activity intolerance, because of course they're tired. They're not getting nutrition. So cognitive delays, right? Because nutrition does help the brain form. 
Sometimes we know because of mom or the family, but sometimes we do not know, depending on how in depth they went during pregnancy. So on visual appearance, what are you going to see? Well, of course, this child is gonna be skinny. This child uh, color is not gonna be good. Sometimes you see the retractions in the chest looking that way. Actually, if you feel the chest, sometimes you feel a buzzing going on in there because of all the secretions that are going on in the lungs. And you're going to see them working hard to breathe. Clubbing, you're not going to see till later on. And it's usually more of a cyanotic heart defect that we're going to go into um, that, you know, O2 saturations can't be uh, normal. The chest, when you listen to it, you're going to hear murmurs. You're going to see abdominal breathing. You're going to see sometimes decreased pulses, whether or not a coarctation doesn't matter because the heart can't beat as well as it should or blood's not circulating the way it should. Um, usually you'll see a child more uh, tachycardic because again, the heart's trying to oxygenate the body saying, hey, I got to do something. And of course, uh, murmurs. So what do we do? Suspected cardiac child. Well, the first thing we do is we hook them up to an EKG and do a 12 lead just to see cardiac rhythm, seeing what's going on. And we can actually see um, hypertrophy or a stretched ventricle, either on the right or the left side, doesn't matter. Just these big things and different leads of the heart. Once we do an echo and we determine there's some sort of cardiac problem, prepare that family for a cardiac catheterization. We need to know what's going on with that child. So we do a diagnostic, find out what's happening. We also can do interventional cardiac caths. And that's when we're doing something to help the child. Uh, we actually control, um, can stop ASD and VSDs with this little device. You put it in, it's like a little uh, plate and the other side's a plate and it goes on the right side and left side and it covers it. In fact, Dr. Burke at Nicholas Children was the first one to be able to do that on small children, which helped children not get open heart surgery because they could um, cover the hole that way. And then there's electrophysiology studies. These are for those children who have tachydysrhythmias. It just means every now and then the heart speeds up. And that means somewhere in that right atrium is saying, you know, I need to beat faster. And all of a sudden it starts to tack, 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 tack. So what they do is they go in with a cardiac calf with a laser and they zap that area and stop it. And this, after a while, they can take children off all the medicines, you know, the um, medicines that's like uh, metropropolol, which stops them from breathing. Beta blockers are stopped because now the heart's beating regularly all the time because that spot that was trying to help the heart out, it was zapped. So as a nurse taking care of a child pre-op and post-op, cardiac catheterization is important. Well, pre-op is the teaching, teaching older children, telling them you will be in bed for 24 hours. You cannot get out of bed. You will have a dressing on your right groin. They put big catheters in there and we don't want the clot to pop off. and We do not want you to bleed. We will tell them not to bend their right leg and we will tell them not to put it on pillows. They will be able to eat and drink normally. Sometimes this dressing, which is really tight, might also have a sandbag on the older children, not on the infants, but older children. Um, they will on admission back now from the cardiac uh, calf. Number one thing priority to check is that dressing. You can imagine a femoral artery on an infant, how big that is. And if that clot pops off, they can bleed out quite fast. So um, making sure that dressing is dry and intact is number one. Then you'll be checking pulses. If they're a little decreased due to irritation, due to the catheters used, you document it. And then you tell the next nurse coming on, there's slightly decreased pulses so that they know what your... Um, original uh, assessment is. 
We also will be doing blood glucose levels because sometimes they get some D5W, some sugar, elevated um, glucose, or it might be low because they didn't get any glucose. So monitoring blood glucose levels is done also. So vital signs, checking pulses, Dressing number one, they can have the head of the bed elevated slowly. They will get fluids, they can eat or drink, but they cannot get out of bed and they need to keep that pressure dressing on their groin for 24 hours. Congenital heart defects. You know, there's more congenital heart defects than I ever realized and I'm started to understand that I worked 10 years in the cardiac ICU at Nicholas Children's Hospital. And my, my most favorite of all experiences, I love my cardiac kids. Um, the thing is the problem and the hard part is that, that many of these children um, do die. And it is one of the major causes of death in the first year of life after the little tiny little premature babies. The most common, defect is a hole between the ventricles, the right and the left side, the ventricle, that septum right there is, there's a hole in it. And that's the most common. Downs children um, are ones that have, um, they're very, um, many of them have cardiac defects. Um, many of the times it's a VSD. And then there's a couple other conditions. I'm not going to confuse you with the names, but VSD on a Downs child is an extremely common occurrence. So we have two types of congenital heart diseases. One, they're acyanotic, which means they're getting perfect O2 saturations. They're at 100, no problem. Then we have cyanotic heart defects and those O2 saturations can be 65%. And that's normal and that's where we want it. And no, we're not gonna put oxygen on it because actually oxygen is a very dangerous to these children with these types of um, diagnoses. Now, one of the things that to understand a cardiac child and holes in the heart is understanding how blood flows within the heart. So if you have an area, remember the left side, as I said, has a higher flow than the right side. So if you have a hole between a chamber that's the atriums or the ventricles, it's going to go from the left side to the right side, and that's called a left to right shunt. Now, when you have an atrial septal or a ventricle septal defect, you will see blood recirculated in the blood, pulmonary blood flow because left to right goes back into the lungs, comes back down and does it again. It's just because there's a hole there and the flow goes from left to the right side. So, these are our classifications of defects. So we have acyanotic, cyanotic, and this is a picture right out of your book. As I said, increased pulmonary blood flow is atrial septal and a ventricular septal defect. The other one that you need to understand is something called a patent ductus arteriosus or a PDA. Well, you learned in OB about fetal circulation, how the lungs are connected to systemic circulation. There's a little connection, a little vessel that connects the pulmonary artery to the aorta. And that's your connection. So it keeps oxygenation going around in the body. These are uh, fetal circulation and they're there at birth up to about 21 days. And what keeps them open is a natural hormone called prostaglandins, which the baby produces. At birth, it usually stops producing it, so it closes naturally. Now, we're going to go into um, when we need to leave it open and when we need to close it. There are medications, and you'll see them on your matching list, one to keep them open and one to close it because we don't want it to do it anymore. We have the obstructive blood flows. We already talked about coarctation of the aorta. That means that garden hose is kinked and everything's going back and up into the lungs and we don't have really good blood flow to the lower extremities and really good blood flow to the upper extremities. Whenever you see stenosis, stenosis is a narrowing. So you have a tube, but it's smaller. It's not this big, it's smaller. Still blood is getting through, but it's not as much as it should be. When you see the word atresia, a means without. 
That means there's nothing, there's no valve, nothing. Um, when you see a decreased pulmonary blood flow and you see tricuspid atresia, where is the tricuspid valve? It's between the right atrium and the right ventricle. There is an atresia, nothing. Blood is not going to the right ventricle, which means it's not going up into the lungs to the pulmonary artery, very dangerous. Another uh, condition, which is the condition that your NCLEX loves to talk about, is called Tetralogy of Fallot. Tetralogy of Fallot is where you get tet spells. You might have heard of that word, tet spells. It's ba basically when a baby turns blue because there's something that happens with the pulmonary artery, whether a piece of tissue or it just closes by itself and absolutely no blood will go into the lungs. My little Nathan, one morning at 3 a.m., decided to have a tet spell on me as I was changing his diaper. He went from O2 sats of 100 down to 10 in about 15 seconds. So what did I do? As a nurse, what I do, because you can't wait for a doc to come because there are minutes and, you know, four minutes, you know, without oxygen is, is what you don't want to do. So in an infant, it's need a chest. So it's either this way or if they're on the side, on the side, you take your knees immediately. And what does that do? They take the pre pressure in the chest and the pressure in the abdomen. When you push it together, it forces the chest to pop open and let that pulmonary artery now get blood. And usually it works, okay? In older children, they just sit down and squat on the floor. They just sit on their feet and does the same thing because there are some older children with tetralogy um, that they don't know or they don't, they don't uh, want to repair it yet and then they just sit down. It's just an automatic thing for them. Now, mixed blood flows, again, cyanotic, is something called transposition of the great arteries. What that is, is the aorta is connected to the lungs and the pulmonary artery is connected to the body. So you have systemic blood flow and you have pulmonic blood flow and they're not mixing. So we need to mix blood. So how do we mix blood as a fetus? We have a patent ductus arteriosus. This is the time where we need to make sure that that heart, that body gets the oxygen it needs. And to connect it to get oxygen, we need to keep that PDA open. And there's a medicine, just like what the natural hormone is called prostaglandins. It helps with cardiac output and it helps that child to oxygenate. And it actually buys a week, two weeks of time until we can do a very controlled, not rushed surgery on these children. The other uh, condition I'll mention is a hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Remember hypoplastic means thick, which means muscles not working and it's a left ventricle. Now, very rare. Um, it is a most, one of the most devastating heart conditions, just like your tricuspid atresia. It's called a half a heart because you don't have a pump and you can't get your oxygen for the tricuspid atresia. Both of these require that PDA to keep open. And it's a continuous drip of prostaglandins given to the child until we can fix the heart. So somehow we can make oxygen go to the body. There's a couple more things about it. You can go closely and read them, but um, I've really described them. Again, anybody who wants more descriptions, please uh, schedule time with me and I'll help you. Congestive heart failure, adults, children, is basically the heart pump's not working. So literally fluid builds up into the lungs. What are you going to see when fluid builds up into the lungs? Well you're going to see tachypnea, tachycardia, retractions. Sometimes you can even hear this. These children are unable to suck, swallow, and breathe, uh, need supplementary oxygen, and we need to somehow get rid of that fluid, and we need that heart to be better. We need to support that heart. Many times with these children, as you see, the lungs should be black. 
these are full of fluids all the way up there. So that's showing you how much fluids is in this heart. So our goal, we want the heart to beat better. Well, it's beating with fluid. So let's give some diuretic. Furosemide is given very well. Um, we are going to monitor these children. Intake output, important. How do we measure output on a infant? Now we're not gonna have a Foley catheter and there's no need for it. They don't believe in it. Well, it is a port for infection. So we measure diapers. How do we measure diapers with, in, for output? Well, a size one diaper weighs 30 grams. You take a diaper off an infant, it weighs 60 grams. You know, 30 minus 60, this child's had 30 uh, mLs of output. So gram per mL is how we do these things, okay? So we measure it. Another thing we do is we monitor their weights, daily weights. Now they should be losing some, but if they're gaining some, maintaining, we know something's going on. A child who has a history of congestive heart failure, we will know that there's a problem starting when we start seeing a decrease in urine output. If they're not putting out urine the way they should, that means they're collecting it. So this is a child, um, the parents need to be taught. Those diapers aren't what you want them to be. The output's decreasing, call the physician. Usually they'll give an extra dose of um, your diuretic. Many of these children go home on digoxin, and furosemide. Now, how are you going to teach a parent about an infant and dig toxicity? Well, we'll measure a heart rate, right? So infants, we need to know what a normal heart rate is. So normal heart rate could be 140 to 160. Well, what if your heart rate was 90 and they're on digoxin? Well, bells should go off. You need to tell the physician, hold the dose and do a dig level. Well, what if the heart rate was basically normal and the kids started retching and vomiting? Huh, another clue. They're not gonna see the yellow dots and halos, but you will see them with the vomiting. Um, it's probably the biggest clue to dig toxicity in infants because that's all really that you can see. So again, we need to improve cardiac function by decreasing the fluids give them something to help the heart beat better. We want them to breathe easier so that they can eat better. During the acute phase of congestive heart failure, they're probably gonna be giving tube feedings to this child or their oral gastric, nasal gastric tube, something with feedings so the child can rest, let the heart rest during this time. We will be doing things to get rid of those fluids on these children and monitoring it with I and O and daily weights. These parents need to know why and what you're doing so that if they get these kids home, if these things happen, they can take care of them before it becomes a big problem. Now, as I said, a lot of these children have cyanotic heart uh, defects where their O2 saturations, even through uh, some of these like hypoplastic left heart get three stage surgeries, three big surgeries, one at birth, one about eight months and one about two to three years old, big cardiac open heart surgeries and their O2 sats, we get them to 90, we're really happy. So the body is, is this great machine and says, okay, your O2 saturations aren't where we want it. So where is oxygen carried in the body? Through red blood cells. So what does the body do? Oh, let me produce more red blood cells. That causes something called polycythemia, an increase in red blood cells because the body's trying to help. Now, there's no more oxygen. The O2 saturations aren't going to go up. But what you're going to see is um, these small children with hemoglobin hematocrits high. Now, normally 14 and 42 is normal you might see 18 and 54, 19, and it's crazy how high it can get. This blood, you'll see it dark, dark, dark red. And that's because the body is overproducing red blood cells. As we get older with these congenital heart defects, 
this is the clubbing that you will see the picture uh, that you're seeing right here. So these families, remember many of these conditions are lifelong um, conditions. You really need to help these parents, um, you know, adjust to what's going on. Remember many of these uh, are children that are just born, they're newborn. So you have mothers who are hormonal, Many who's had C-sections who now have to get out of their hospital, come over to the children's hospital or a different area in the hospital to go see their child. So they're exhausted, they're in pain, and they're hormonal. So letting that mother understand what's going on, um, helping them, educating them, uh, explaining why you're measuring diapers, what you're listening to lungs, and help them understand what's going to be happening to their child. Because on admission, you as a nurse are planning for discharge. Doesn't matter if it's an infant or it's an adult, that's just normal. And helping the, the mother to bond with these children. Um, many times these children are so ill when they come as newborns that they can't be held right away. So I would have these mothers comb their hair, help me change a diaper, maybe rub a little lotion, just to help this mother bond with the child. Endocarditis, adults, children, doesn't matter. It's an infection of the inner lining of the heart. And of course, any procedures, they need prophylaxis. Now in pediatrics, there are two conditions due to a streptococcal pharyngitis that wasn't treated or not completely treated. And what happens with rheumatic fever is a couple weeks after the strep throat, this child's gonna start complaining of joint pain, um, fever, sore throat, just not feeling well. A little um, rash you're going to see on these child. Now, the first question when we start, and sometimes there is uh, something called chorea, which is a, an unequal gait, and even sometimes they fall. And usually that's what brings them in to find out what's going on. Um, if we get a child looking like that, one of the first questions is, has your child been sick lately? And if you hear that they have had a sore throat a couple weeks ago, you can sort of gather that's probably rheumatic fever. Now, if this continues and goes on and not treated for you know, a month or two, it could permanently um, cause valve damage. And usually the mitral valve gets um, um, hit really, really hard. So rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease is due to an undertreated or not treating strep um, pharyngitis. Years ago, we didn't check children for cholesterol, but now we realize that children do get high cholesterol, and we're gonna treat them just like adults. Um, make sure they take their medicine, make sure that they watch their diet, you know, and to follow them closely. Children get all sorts of dysrhythmia, slow, fast, or irregular. I've seen children as young as 12, 14 months get pacemakers put in because their SA note isn't beaten good enough. I told you the tacky dysrhythmias, Usually those eventually, as the kid gets older, we will do some sort of cardiac cath and we'll zap the area to try to help them. And then um, PVCs, you know, placing them on medications to help them. Pulmonary artery hypertension is when the lungs are damaged and they tighten up and doesn't allow oxygen and carbon dioxide to exchange. These are usually due to some problem in the heart that has caused this in children. And these children are very short of breath. I've seen children with pulmonary artery hypertension that are on these infusions continuously that they have to carry with them and it helps them breathe. And basically the cure is double heart, a uh, double lung transplant. Cardiomyopathy, big stretch, floppy heart that's not working. As I said, it could be due to familiar, it could be due to that viral infection, metabolic, collagen vascular, something happened and that heart just got swelled up. And usually again, the heart just doesn't work well, even with medication, so they end up with a transplant. The biggest problem with transplant is rejection. Now I have had the privilege of watching several 
of my children, hypoplastic left hearts, which is the worst one, um, have to, about the age of seven or eight, require a transplant. My one little boy, Tommy, is going to have his 10th year on Valentine's Day, that he's had his heart and he's lived a beautiful life. Last year, I heard of my girl, Olivia. She had just turned 22. This is how long ago. So she had her heart for over 10 years and it failed and they tried to do another one and she didn't make it. Um, but what was really beautiful about it is how the mother sent me a message and said that because of the way I taught her and Olivia as they were growing you know, with this heart condition, they were teaching the new nurses, the young nurses of those tricks that Boop used to always do for her. So it's still warm and dear to my heart. We never checked younger children for hypertension. So now we are checking ages two and up to make sure, because young children do get high blood pressure. And we know that high blood pressure untreated can cause a lot of things, especially you know hurting the kidneys. And then there's a condition called Kawasaki disease. Kawasaki disease is a viral condition. It is an acute systemic vasculitis. Um, they say unknown, but usually it's, you know, the upper respiratory, been sick for a while, given antibiotics, nothing works. You know, almost like your mononucleosis type thing. And then all of a sudden you start seeing their palms like peeling or swelling a little bit, their soles of their feet, their palms of their hand. And then they get these big red eyes, like glow in the dark red eyes, strawberry tongue, and then a fine rash. Now, the uh, rheumatic fever is this big um, erythema type of rash. In Kawasaki, it's a tiny little fine rash all over the place. Our biggest concern with Kawasaki disease is because it really affects the vasculature. We're worried about the coronary arteries. And many of these times, let's, let's go untreated, it can have a bulging or an aneurysm. And if the aneurysm blows, you know, there's not a good outcome. How do we treat Kawasaki disease? Well, this is the only disease in a child that we will give aspirin to. These children are given IVIG, which is intravenous immunoglobin, usually for about a month and they're given um, aspirin. Now, why do they give aspirin? Well, this is a vasculitis. There's little micro clots going on there. So it helps prevent clots and it's also an anti-inflammatory. And the IVIG boosts the immune system to help the child fight the disease. Once they're done with Kawasaki, they're not gonna get it again. I've never seen a double case of it. And actually they do really well if caught soon enough. Children, infants, premature, doesn't matter. Any of them go in shock. What do you see with shock? All of a sudden the blood pressure below, you can't get it up and the heart rate tries to compensate by being really, really tacky. Some children can compensate it, some don't. Um, usually a shock in children is due to overwhelming sepsis, an infection. They get so overwhelmed with infection, they go into shock. So I have a question now. Surgical closure of that PDA, that opening between the pulmonary artery and the aorta, once you close it, what would you know is gonna happen? Anybody? Nobody? Is it D? It is D, absolutely. So the aorta has high pressure coming off and it goes up the PDA back into the lungs. I mean, it could go both ways, but usually it's back up into the lungs. So yes, it prevents the return of oxygenated blood to the lungs. Once a PDA is closed, you will that murmur, that machine murmur that's going on for the PDA, you'll stop hearing it. That's how you know without doing an echo that you can see it. Another thing with a PDA, usually it's your young, a lot of them are young premature infants that it keeps open and it just still there. Their blood pressure on a young 
premature infant, could be 60 over 40 normally. A child who has a PDA that's open and not closed could have 60 over 15, wide pulse pressure. Once you close the PDA, you'll see it go to 60 over 40. So you know it worked. Now, if we're not doing a surgical closure of a PDA, we can do a, a by medicine closure. And it is closed by a medicine called indomethacin. Indomethacin is an NSAID, but we give an IV. It's a, we can do it, give it up to three times. And again, as we're giving it, we hear the murmur go away, the pulse pressure narrow. We know the indomethacin is working. So did I lose everybody today? A lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. So who wants to win a cahoots today? Nobody? I really like the cahoots. <laughs> <laughs> good. It's a good reinforcement of what we've just gone over. As I said, yeah, the cahoots you are really good. They, they give a lot of information and it's helpful for the test too. Yeah, it sure is. They're good for the test, they're good for the HESI, and they're good for your NCLEX. I try to, to do things to help y'all. Hold on, let me get it working. So nobody wants to win today. That's what I've heard. Da, da, da. No, it's not what I want. Hold on, my computer's being silly. My husband's grandson just came over from North Carolina. So if you hear crying in the background, that's who it is. Come on, hurry up and load. There we go. I think he's going to be two pretty soon. So he's really cute. I think you can tell by now I like kids. You think I so? Too. I just always feel really awkward when I have to babysit and then I like, they do something bad and then I'm like, oh, you got to stand in the corner. Yeah. You know, you still have to. They can't get away with it. But let me tell you, they try. <laughs> I feel like they know that I'm like awkward every time I <laughs> try. Oh, they know I'm a wuss. My five-year-old grandson, uh, Christian, when he comes over, he'll come to me for things when mom and dad says no. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm not going against mom and dad. Sorry, I know. But here, have some of this. <laughs> right, I feel the same way. <laughs> I love it. That's what grandma's supposed to do. I think we're making pretty good time today with everything. There's 55 questions, we'll be out on time. Only four people playing today. Oh, wait, give me a minute. I, was, I tried to go on my phone, but my Wi-Fi is really bad, so I've disconnected to my hotspot. Okay. Oh, wait, one more minute, I'm going to go. Yeah, the number, Sam. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Let's start her up. Respiratory and cardiac. A lot of repetition. Try to keep up with it. A majority of upper respiratory infections are caused by what?
you know, parents get really upset because they go into the pediatrician, kids sick, 104 fever, mucus, coughing, and they say, oh, it's just a viral illness, Tylenol, Motrin, and fluids, and it's a virus. It's not till after three, four days of being sick will they put you on an antibiotic because most of the time it's a virus. Multi-select. What would you suspect if a child has a dry, bothersome cough that keeps them awake at night? Actually, it's not a multi-select. It's actually a one question answer. It was miscued. I'm sorry, I forgot to change it. I changed it and changed it wrong. Dry, bothersome cough that keeps them awake at night. Usually there's a history of a upper respiratory. Um, it's bronchitis. Have you ever had bronchitis? All you do is cough, 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 especially at night. And what they'll do is they'll give you cough medicine to try to suppress it. It is not croup. Croup um, is, you'll be barking all the time, but bronchitis is that inflammation in the bronchus. And you'll see it's mostly at night that you'll see that dry, horrible cough, keeping that kid awake. The preventative immunization for RSV is what? It's called Synergist, okay? HIV is your hepatitis, and indocin is to close the PDA. Your indomethacin, close the PDA. Synergist is a palsimumab. It is a once a month injection immunization given to those high risk uh, children, one years of age and less. All of the following are signs of early respiratory distress in children except so in respiratory distress tachypnea tachycardic uh, retracting diaphoretic decreased um, capillary refill too because you're just trying to breathe so hard when that child's going bradycardic, get the child ready to be coded. That kid is sick. That kid is going to crash and burn really quick. A four-year-old child's been taking medicines for asthma and they're still wheezing. What information is important to know? <clears throat> So if you have a child that they're taking medicine, it's not working, find out how they're taking the medicines. It could be as simple as teaching the parent on how to use a spacer so that they do get their medicine, okay? It's very important. Don't assume they know how to give the medicine. An eight month old with croup exhibits what signs and symptoms of respiratory distress? <clears throat> So in an eight month old, you are not going to see a pulse rate of 88, it's gonna be higher. Um, usually their SATs are normal, 100%. Their heart rate of 140 is not specific to croup, but you're gonna see respiratory distress, subternal retractions, restlessness. When it's going there, think what is respiratory? What are you going to see? Signs and symptoms of asthma include all except. So remember asthma is a hyper responsiveness of the, the airways, the, the bronchus and the trachea, and they inflame and they start to close. And initially they're gonna be 
coughing, 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 coughing because it's sort of irritated in there. They're gonna become short of breath and you're gonna hear wheezing. And what you're gonna hear is a prolonged expiratory phase because you can get air in, but you can't get it out. You might hear at the end of a breath, a little and that's all you're gonna hear sometimes in the lungs. It becomes that tight in there. Signs and symptoms of congenital heart disease include all except So they're not going to be gaining weight normally. They're going to have poor feeding tires easily, tachypnic, tachycardic, absolutely, because they're working so hard. Their heart is, but they're burning calories. They tire easily. They're not eating. So weight, weight gain, not appropriate. They're going to be losing weight. They're going to be behind the level. What should you not do to children diagnosed with croup or epiglottitis? Remember, both of those are the swelling of the upper pharynx and, you know, the larynx, and they're all swollen back there. So you don't want to go back there and create more swelling because they're barely breathing as it is. Only somebody who'll intubate or do a trach should be opening that mouth and looking. The epiglottis is what? What is an epiglottis? It's a leaf-like cartilage that covers the trachea when you swallow to prevent aspiration. The butterfly stays up top. A multi-select. When doing an admission on an infant with a low-grade fever and a loose cough, what information is important? Child's being admitted, you're the nurse, you're doing a nursing admission history. What do you need to know to take care of this kid? <clears throat> so APGARs aren't as important. Um, physicians will ask, but really not. You wanna know how high the fever gets. When was the last dose that you gave so that you can give some? And you wanna know what the immunization immunization statuses, you want to know how to even protect yourself or to isolate that child until they determine what this is all about. What is cystic fibrosis? Now, cystic fibrosis is this mucus which collects in the lungs and the small intestines, and it's an inability to process food and requires uh, intensive, intensive nursing care and for the family to also. Cystic fibrosis is at birth. Um, it is um, usually familiar. If one child has it in a family, possibility another. And um, it requires uh, enzymes to digest food. Um, and it also requires intense, intense, chest physical therapy. What is the greatest risk for an infant having a cardiac catheterization? Biggest thing is the hemorrhage. Biggest thing is the hemorrhage. Um, usually the reactions are less. You're gonna have slightly decreased pulses. Dysrhythmias usually during the procedure, they can, yes, but the biggest worry is the hemorrhage. Remember the femoral artery, artery is huge. That clack comes off, this infant will bleed out quickly. How is cystic fibrosis identified?
So cystic fibrosis, if there's not a familiar history with it, um, you will do something called a sweat test. You'll see infants with cystic fibrosis testing done where they have not moved their bowels in you know two days after birth. That's one of the things that can cause that constipation or because usually infants almost immediately they're going to be stooling that meconium and they don't. So they'll be testing for it. Now, if you literally licked this child, you will taste salt. Now, I'm not telling you ever to lick another child's baby, but if you did, they lose so much salt. These children require the salt shaker for dinner. These kids can have it. They're going to get high protein meals. They're going to be getting high caloric meals um, to help them along with their pancreatase enzymes with every meal. A multi-select. What is included in the plan of care for a child with cystic fibrosis? So aggressive physical chest therapy. I mean, their lungs are like Petri dishes, thick, thick mucus down there, high protein. These pancreatic enzymes are with meals. You can open the capsules. You can sprinkle it on food for younger children. Just make sure they rinse their mouth out. Um, they, with meals, exactly, not before, like right with them. And um, also remember as a child grows that they are going to need higher doses is something that we do tend to forget about that. And, you know, this is something that, you know, you'd never, never chew and crush these, just put them on the meals or swallow them. What is the drug of choice for pharmacologic closure of that patent ductus arteriosus? So you have that connection between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. We know that prostaglandins keeps it open, either naturally or if we give it because we want it open, like with a transposition of great arteries, we want it to close it with just medicines we use in demethicin. Good job. What is not a feature of tetralogy of Fallot? Remember, tetralogy is all a right-sided defect. Has to do with oxygen, tet spells, blue spells, right side of the heart. So aortic stenosis is on the left side, has nothing to do with it. You're going to see that pulmonary arteries can have some narrowing. You're going to see a hole between the ventricle septums called a ventricular septal defect. You will see because when that pulmonary artery closes, that right ventricle is going to swell because blood can't go up. So it collects and stretch it. And the other little thing you'll see is sometimes the aorta, it's called overriding aorta, will push over a little bit. So there's four different things with a tetralogy child. What medication would you hold for an infant that is vomiting and has a 98-88-32 TPR? And remember, vomiting is a clue of dig toxicity. So digoxin will be old. And then you see an infant with a heart rate of 88. That's your big clue. And Mary's on fire. Why would a child with tetralogy of Fallot not gain weight at the normal rate? And it has to do with the inadequate oxygenation. There's no energy and they're not going to eat. Plus the heart is working hard, burning calories. Very good. All our examples of cyanotic heart murmurs, except which one? 
It's not a truncus. I didn't go over that. You don't need to know all of them. There are a lot more conditions that I could tell you about. I'm not doing that to you. So cyanotic heart disease, tetralogy is the number one, okay? Tricuspid atresia means there's no opening between the right and left ventricle. How's the blood going into the pulmonary artery into the lungs? It's not. Aortic stenosis is just a narrowing of when the blood goes out to the body. That is not cyanotic. And truncus, I'm not talking to you about. That's not it. Don't want to confuse you. What is the most common cyanotic congenital heart defect? I've said it a few times. <laughs> Tetralogy of flow. A PDA oxygenates. It keeps the body oxygenated. It's fetal circulation. It puts the pulmonary artery to the aorta. It gives the body oxygen. So that is not cyanotic. The tetralogy is. It's when blood can't go to the lungs, O2 sats from 100 to 10 in 15 seconds. Remember that. It happened to me. Nursing care following a cardiac catheterization. <clears throat> so we're going to assess that insertion site for a hematoma and bleeding um, to make sure there's no bleeding because it could be swelling underneath and it could be pushing up and could also cause, um, you know, pushing on that area and not letting blood go down to the leg too. So hematoma, bleeding, big deals. Nursing education for cardiac catheterization include all except Excellent. You cannot bend that leg. Good job. Which information is the most important when rheumatic fever is suspected? Remember, rheumatic fever is caused by pharyngitis, strep pharyngitis, undertreated or not treated. There's two conditions in pediatrics you'll see. This is the first one. Signs of shock in children include all of the following except. You know, shock is when the heart is not working the way it should. Um, you're going to see decreased urine output. You're going to see poor capillary refill, tach tachycardia, hypotension. You're not going to see the, the blood pressure high. You're going to see it opposite. And if you're not getting oxygen, you're going to be an altered mental status and restlessness and all of those things because of hypoxemia, because it's just blood's not going where it should. And the butterfly went back to top. What is the treatment for Kawasaki disease? Remember, Kawasaki is systemic vasculitis. It's an inflammation of vessels. And we're most concerned about the coronary arteries because they can form aneurysms. So once we have a diagnosis of Kawasaki, the next thing we're going to do is an echocardiogram to make sure those coronary arteries are OK. Yes, we give aspirin and IVIG. Aspirin, why? To prevent clots and for um, anti-inflammatory and intravenous immunoglobins to help boost the system's uh, immune system. 
Which of the following best describes the pathophysiology of Kawasaki disease? It has to do with vasculitis, worried about the coronary arteries. A multi-select. A clinical manifestation of Kawasaki is what? I think of Kawasaki, I think of a motorcycle. <laughs> So it's not erythema marginum, it is that fine rash. The erythema, remember that's rheumatic fever, okay? You're gonna see the blistered palms, cracked palms and soles of feet, red and eyes, strawberry tongue, cracked lips and the fine rash and fevers too. And Mary's up top again. Why is an echocardiogram needed for the patient with Kawasaki? Why do we have to do an echocardiogram? This is a vasculitis. So we know we want to identify any sort of um, coronary abnormalities. We want to make sure that there's no aneurysms going on. And if we find one, we need surgery now. Which of the following is the most common cause of shock in infant and children's? Remember shock, decreased capillary refill, decreased urine output, tachycardia, hypotension, mental changes, restlessness. And we know the most common cause is infection, overwhelming sepsis, yes. What are the defects associated with tetralogy of Fallot? Again, remember, tetralogy, right-sided, has to do with that pulmonary artery and blood can't flow into the lungs. So it's the pulmonary artery stenosis. It's the VSD, the aorta, as I said, moves over. And then that right ventricle gets a little floppy because it gets stretched and the blood can't go up into the pulmonary artery. A young child tetralogy of Fallot may assume which position naturally when having a tet spell. Not all children are fixed as infants. Sometimes they're older. And they squat because remember, we need to change the pressure between the chest and the abdomen. Squatting does that. In infants, knee chest. Transposition of the great arteries is what? What are the great arteries of the heart? And transposition means switched. So the pulmonary artery is where the aorta should be. And the aorta is where the pulmonary artery should be. They are switched, which means you're not getting any oxygen around. So what do we need to keep this child alive? We need to have that patent ductus arteriosus open to allow some oxygen. And we do that, how? Prostaglandins, it helps with cardiac output and with oxygenation. Which of the following is not an intervention indicated for the transposition of the great arteries? Yeah. 
Remember, this child is not oxygenated. When that duct closes, there's no oxygenation. This child will die. So we need to do things pretty quick so that this child gets oxygen around. So oral anything is gonna do nothing for this child, nothing, okay? We wanna put on the intravenous prostaglandins, why? That helps keep the patent ductus arteriosus opening, which allows oxygen to go from the lungs to the body. There is a patent foramen ovale um, open at birth, it's normal. We go in and through a cardiac cath and we put a balloon and we punch a bigger hole. So now allow an exchange of right and left side. And the surgery, which is called to do this, to correct it, is called an arterial switch operation. These children do very well. It's a very complicated surgery, but once they get over the surgery, they do very, very, very well. A multi-select. Why is prostaglandins given to a child with transposition of the great arteries? Now, I just told you, let me see if you got it. It helps with oxygenation and maintains cardiac output. It has nothing to do with infection. It's not an antibiotic. It is a prostaglandin. It's a hormone to keep the patent ductus arteriosus open so that we can have oxygen to this poor body. What is the purpose of giving endomethacin to a neonate with a PDA, your patent ductus? What does endomethacin do? So when we have a duct open, that means the body's producing prostaglandins to keep it open because that's what you need. So the endomethacin says, okay, prostaglandin, that's enough. And then the duct closes because of that. Where is the patent ductus arteriosus? So the patent ductus arteriosus is a tube that connects the lungs, the pulmonary artery to the body, the aorta. It keeps oxygenation going when we need it. <clears throat> this heart defect allows blood to pass from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. You know, between the ventricles or the atrium, there's a septum, which means it keeps them apart. When there's a hole between the ventricles, it's a ventricular septal defect. When there is a hole between the atrium, it's an atrial septal defect. And it allows oxygenated blood. You'd go back in and get reoxygenated because it goes from left to right shunt, multi-select. What is a sign of ditch toxicity in infants? <clears throat> Nausea, vomiting, and heart rate of that's low. They can't see yellow spots. They can't tell you that there's yellow spots. They may, but they can't express that to you. A multi-select. Where can the blood go when the PDA closes? <laughs> Thank you. 
it either stays in the body or stays in the lung. It's not going to do any switching across. It connects the pulmonary artery to the aorta. <clears throat> what is congestive heart failure? Does it matter if you're an adult or an infant child? Congestive heart failure is congestive heart failure. <clears throat> and it comes because there's weak heart and fluid builds up and the body, the child will look like tachypnic, tachycardic, you know, and failure to thrive and can't feed. Um, and we need to get rid of the fluid. We need to help the heart. And we need to do INO and we need to daily weights and help that kid get better. So left-sided congestive heart failure causes rot. Think about my garden hose. That left ventricle's not working good. It's not pumping the way it should. So you're gonna see all respiratory stuff, shortness of breath, fluid, coughing, yes. A multi-select. Signs and symptoms of rheumatic fever include Now, the one good thing about rheumatic fever, once we determine what it is, we give a, a long-term um, antibiotic therapy. It could be four to six weeks. Even Korea, that gait and stuff will all dissipate. They'll all go away. And this is the erythema margitum rash, that big um, demarcated rash that you will see on them. And it will all go away as long as we caught it quick enough. After a heart transplant, what is the leading reason children die? <clears throat> and it is called rejection. It's not infection. The body says, yeah, no, I don't like this heart. That's why they're on the immunosuppressant drugs for life. A multi-select. A child's about to have a chest tube removed. What should you do? You're the nurse. These tubes are coming out. How are you going to take care of this kid? We're going to explain everything. We're going to have that kid sitting up. We don't want them laying down. Can you breathe laying down? Usually chest tubes are due in the lungs. So we want them sitting up and we want to medicate them. It burns, it hurts getting those tubes pulled out. So those are the things, not laying down. That's supine, it's not a good idea. A child just had abdominal cardiac surgery, can't cough well enough to expectorate secretions. What is your priority? How are you going to keep those lungs open and moving? What's the first thing you do? Priority. <clears throat> you're going to medicate him for pain. Then you're going to have them up, sitting in a chair, moving them, using incentive spirometry, and having them emulate outside. But number one, medicate them. It hurts. If it hurts, nobody's going to do nothing. An infant of three months has a fever of 1036. What are you going to medicate this infant with? A three month old, what medicine can you use? Tylenol only. You cannot give Motrin until an infant is six months old. So for the first six months of life, only Tylenol, acetaminophen. At six months old, you can alternate it. There's something to do with platelet aggregation and bleeding from the infant's blood being immature. So no Motrin until six months old. A newborn is assessed. They find very weak lower extremities. What should you assess next? What do you suspect very weak lower extremity pulses?
So I'm suspecting coarctation of the aorta. I told you the lower extremities would be a lower blood pressure. The upper ones are gonna be higher, about 20 millimeters of mercury higher. So if I do a four extremity blood pressure, I'm gonna see the difference. And with those weak lower extremities, I'm gonna tell the physician and he's gonna say, okay, let's do our echocardiogram. Now we're suspecting coarctation. I actually found one uh, in my very beginning stages of working in newborn ICU. I was so happy with myself. <laughs> Multi-select. A critical ill child is on complete bed rest. What can a nurse do to prevent complications? Now, don't think because there are children, they don't have problems with their lungs or getting blood clots or even decubitus. They get them, okay? So how are we going to prevent those things? So we are going to turn every two hours, not every six hours. We're going to use that instead of spirometry, pillows, um, head of bed. Also, we're going to make sure that they have some sort of, if they're older and don't have diapers, some sort of uh, like a chucks underneath them so that we can change them and keep them dry so we can prevent things like decubituses. Good job. A multi-select. How can oxygen be delivered that's easy as tolerated and accurately monitored for infants? Easy as tolerated and accurately monitored. Oxyhood is really good. It's this clear plastic thing. You can go up to 40, 50% in it very easily. Um, and they can still suck their fingers in their pacifier. Nasal cannula, you have to tape it on them. Sometimes it bothers their nose, but they can still suck. Blow by, you can't monitor it. And an endotracheal tube, uh, easiest tolerated to be intubated is not fun. I know I've been intubated. It's not fun. You gag and choke on it. Multi-select. What procedure are used to keep the lungs open with a child with cystic fibrosis? So deep breathe, cough, exercise, chest PT, and ambulating, not PRN, as much as we possibly can. Most important thing, they have all sort of these chest things that vibrate, all these things that we use for them. A multi-select. Children with cystic fibrosis require pancreatic enzymes with meals. What teaching should be done to the child and for the parents? There's actually an NCLEX question that you'll see just like this. So you take them right before meals. You can sprinkle it if you can't swallow it. Make sure they rinse their mouth. It's just like taking the Simbacort. You have to rinse when you're done. And um, again, increase the dose as they get bigger. What is the cardiac defect when there's no valve? between the right atrium and right ventricle. No valve between the right atrium and the right ventricle. What is the valve that's between the right atrium and the right ventricle? And it's your tricuspid valve. Remember, A, atresia, A without. Stenosis is a little narrowing, so that's open. Tetralogy has nothing to do with that opening. It's the pulmonic and the VSD is there's a hole between the septum and the ventricles. What is the greatest risk factor for a newborn receiving a cardiac catheterization?
Again, it's the hemorrhage. Good job. Yes, I know there was a question like that earlier. And last question. When an infant is breathing fast, tires easily, and needs rest periods during feeding, what should you assess? What do you think is going on? Breathing fast, tires easy, needs rest periods. What do you think is going on there? And what should you assess? Breath sounds, breathing fast. It means something's going on in those lungs. And if they can't, um, tires easily, they're not getting oxygen. So probably they're in congestive failure. Number three, Sam. Good job, Sam. Number two, a butterfly. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Number one, Mary. Good job, Mary. Number four. Oh, we got the monkey see no evil and Leland. What I want you to do is sign your attendance attestations, make sure that they get done so you don't forget. Remember anybody who wants to meet with me, I am more than glad and willing to meet with you from the exam, about cardiac, respiratory, whatever you need. Um, and if I can help you with anything, let me know. If not, thank you guys. You held on pretty good. That was a rough one. Take care, guys. Ms. Pilger, if I can stay on, that would be really great. Sure, not a problem. Did you just want me to wait until you were um, done with Mercedes? Sure. Okay, I can just stay on. It's okay, if, if she doesn't mind. If you want, I can leave and then come back. What do you want, Rach? I'm fine either way, it really doesn't matter go. to me. It's okay. Anybody else? Have a good day, Professor. You too, Mercedes. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Have a good day. You too, Mary. I don't know why I thought that was Mercedes that asked and not Rachel. It's okay. Poor Rachie. It's okay. It's all right. Okay, so I'm just going to ask a quick question um, sure. regarding the lecture. So I'm looking at slide four, four sorry, <laughs> okay. um, from the PowerPoint, okay. um, where it goes like through the ages and maternal antibodies and infection rates and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering with the maternal antibodies, so like with the whole COVID stuff um, and people like mothers being told they should get the vaccine if they're pregnant so that their babies have the antibodies, blah, blah, blah. Um, after the three months, do they have a decreased amount of those antibodies or do they have no antibodies no, it, at all? It, it decreases. Okay. It does decrease. Um, okay. We remember that first six weeks of an infant's life is the most critical because they have right. nothing in them. So yeah. having something from the mother can help them. They're basically immunosuppressed. You know, an okay. infant who has a fever beyond six weeks and older is a high level alert chart when they come right. into an emergency room because of that. So yeah. having the immunization protects them and it wears down. And then usually about six months old, they start the flu vaccines at six right. months old. So, I mean, I'm sure they're going to get the COVID down to the same thing eventually. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering because like my sister-in-law, my nephew's um, nine months old, and she ended up getting it like just before um, he was born, and like everything ended up being fine and all. But like now she's all worried because um, she like he can't get the vaccine yet. So, well, you know, um, children. She listen. She exposed him right before with COVID, so he's got a little bit there. You know, yeah. and, no, and I mean, she got the vaccine. Slowly. She didn't get yeah. COVID. She got the oh, vaccine. Okay. So, yeah. So <laughs> oh, I was going to say at birth. Yeah. Um, no, but it should, it should be okay. And usually infants, children, I don't know why, but they don't get it. Like the adults, it's, it's different. Yeah. I'm not saying they don't, but it is a lot less. So right. just being careful, not being silly, yeah. you know, uh, protecting them as much as possible, keeping people away from your kid. I don't care if he's cute. Take your hands off of him. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> Get um, out of here. 
The other thing that I wanted to, to tell you was a couple of weeks ago, I told you about my problem child at work oh. um, and how we were having problems with him and everything else. Okay. And I wanted to give you an update that he's doing a lot better. Um, he still has like a little bit of outburst depending on like who he's with. Um, I'm part-time, but he like is obsessed when I come in. Like he told a teacher the other day that he was going to come pick me up in his dump truck. And I was oh. like, well, <laughs> <laughs> that's so cute right <laughs> so I was See, like okay that's, like that's being a nurse that's being <laughs> understanding of him and giving him yeah you know a little control of his life yeah the biggest awesome. problem now is like trying to keep him from like stealing other kids toys or like sometimes if another kid is stealing from a third kid then he gets all upset and like gives the toy back and then the third kid gets upset like it's 